This is Robert Stark. I am joined here with uh, John uh, Dilworth. Uh, John, it's great having you on the show. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Pill Eater. And I'm also joined here with my uh, co-host, uh, Pill Eater. And Pill Eater, you've been a fan for a long time. Yes, I have. Since you were a kid. I'm actually qu- quite excited for uh, to get John's attention to be on our show. I'm actually a huge fan of his art. I discovered him recently through you, but I did watch the show uh, Doug on Nickelodeon as a kid. <laughs> you know, but John oh, was- my. But I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's not my... That's not my show. That's it's this that it's Jim Jenkins show. show or something. I remember that's Doug a Jim too. Jenkins show. Yeah. yeah. When I was eight but, years old, uh, I, I first saw Courage. I think I was really young, and the first episode I saw was the the, the Duck Brothers, and was this kind of strange, cute cartoon. I liked it because there was a pink dog in it. And then when I was like that eight night nine years old, I started watching it religiously, and was like Cartoon Network was like the only channel on that time, and so eventually it was like. Kind of the only cartoon I got into at that, but it wasn't until later that after when I got older that I, I you know, I looked up John R. Dilworth and John himself is a very accomplished uh, animator and has many uh, cartoons since the uh, late '80s and going it from there, you know. And With there's your first project, it was a, a student film in a 1985, Pierre. Oh yeah, Pierre, of course, of course. But it's interesting that, uh, Pill Eater, you mentioned, uh, you described Courage as pink. And in fact, he is pink. <laughs> but when I colored him, I wasn't thinking pink as a marketing tool. I was thinking of pink as a bit, um, you know, soft, gentle, right? Fragile with the world. Is it like fush- uh, Fushenta or that's Oh, like- fuchsia, fuchsia is what the network's marketing department began pushing. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> it was believed that boys would not be interested in pink stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was it so we could be blue or something? Well, yeah, listen, if I, if I had the smarts back then, probably I would have made the, the dog blue. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, my the royalties would be so much better. You'd be like teal. But, <laughs> I can't, you know, but that's the way it is. And, and it's sad, too, because it brings up a lot of questions about prejudices and engineered ones. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're talking about you have a lot millenniums. Of, you have a lot of cartoons which are uh, unfinished pilots that haven't been released to networks. I mean, just recently on your YouTube channel, uh, one of those unfinished pilots was Prudence, and it looked very similar to Courage. And there's two different versions of Prudence. I really like the first one because that's really hits home of that, that, that courage style where it's this like horror kind of very surreal stuff. And it's also that one with uh, the monkeys, Chips and Chugal or, <laughs> or something like that. It just seems like oh, yeah. I, I wish they were made, but the, in some alternate reality, it's unfortunate that the networks can't pick it up and it's just lost art in, in some respect. You know, it seems like it's very competitive. I know yeah, your I uh, work has a very kind of a surrealist uh, feel were you influenced by like a uh, Horace and Gromit? <laughs> That's funny. I never thought of that. Um, no, I mean, Dali. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, I, can I can definitely, definitely see, see that. Uh, the Dali in there. I mean, I know you recently worked with stop motion. Uh, I know in Rinky Dink, there's a this whole stop motion uh, sequence, and in early episodes, of, later episodes of Courage, there is some of that uh, stop motion sequencing on it. I mean, it's just I'm a big fan of mixed media. I always have, from the early days of my experimenting in film. I always felt like the mediums were, were natural, uh, naturally simpatico. Uh, look how many people exist in one small space and still can get along, let's hope. Well, for me, that's the same as the mediums. All it requires is the right aesthetic balance so that it all works together. There's nothing worse... I mean, from my point of view, than seeing an attempt at mixed media, but there's no cohesion. There's no, there's no, like an inner illusion to it. We have to be careful that, yes, these things can exist. And you know what show I really admire? That one with the cats, the cat family, and has every cut gumball. Gumball. I, you know, okay. <laughs> I yeah. love the way that they mix that. Oh, yeah. Do you watch art? Pi- do you like pickles and peanut? <laughs> 
that's really mixed media. That's on Disney. Really? Well, that probably yeah. They basically, well, yeah, that it's makes like sense. it's like they they'll do like a, a paper sequence and then a clay sequence. There's just so much going on that I, I can't really. It's more like an artsy show. You can turn off the TV on mute and watch the show for its media. Yeah. But I know what you're yeah. saying with gumballs that is the same way. Um, but yeah, a lot of these new the newer cartoons they're 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 being very uh, free form with their medium. But it also seems to me that the whole kind of lowbrow art that was like really popular um, like ten or twenty years ago has now became mainstream. Where it seems like these hip cartoons. Uh, Pillator, what are you referring to specifically? Um. You know, I'm just thinking of like the classic MTV cartoons, like Eon Flux and like the Max, or uh, <laughs> like the, these cartoons that oh, originally were... those were progressive. I wouldn't consider them lowbrow. Not to oh, be yeah. contrary. No, I mean lowbrow. They were is, like, the art aggressive. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean I thought, lowbrow isn't like a you know the whole fine art like kind of movement. It was yeah definitely. And I'm saying and nobody is producing that now. Yes, yes, it's it's true. I mean, um, right courage now, would not get produced now. I, I know you tried One to do the CGI. Other uh, theme I've noticed is kind of your you you have this like surreal theme and also the, kind of a horror theme in a lot of your work and comedy. Don't forget Co- comedy, yeah, Robert. Comedy, uh, horror, all those themes. I remember as a uh, kid in the '90s, like there were children's horror shows like Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yeah. But I noticed there's been a and goosebumps. Of, oh goosebumps. yeah, yeah. But there's been a kind of decline in that. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, it, you know, you understand how the market works. Who is who are the people behind this the market? You know, uh, it's I believe it's all manipulated. If there's a trend, and it's it's getting the numbers, it's getting the ads. You track it, mm-hmm. and when you see it dipping, just change. You do something else. You change it up. Change it up. It seems like some of your stuff might be uh, too dark. Or two of the uh, on the not the same well, cliche. It's on the horror side, like from oh, Courage Made, but it yes, just seems like yes. there's this dark art where if you tune into like the Disney Channel, like I'm thinking of Star versus the Forces of Evil, where it's this kind of teen uh, show where it's in between the ages of like uh, 15 to like moving on 18, but ironically, it could be watched by people my age in their early 20s, and it could be a show related to that college age rather instead. And I think it's it's strange that do we live in like some kind of softer generation now and now art is kind of what makes you feel good about yourself or, or some kind of aesthetic where it's more about romance or something like that. I don't know. That's something to think about. Like like um, how powerful anime has been in the past 20 years and how now it's uh, infiltrated in our art culture and it's kind of like now everyone has their own anime spinoff or at least has influence by either the chibi art style or to some respect maybe manga I don't know it's interesting yeah I don't know how to comment on that if infatuation but it's a cult and I, I feel like a lot of it may be connected to how we are receiving the forms um, a good interview would be to try and get to the bottom of the attraction between the sort of religious following of manga on Western, the Western mind. Were Think you influenced it. by uh, the early uh, manga, like the film Akira from the 80s and the Padalero from the 70s? <laughs> but, oh, what about... Um, uh, Ghost in the Shell. Oh yeah, they're they're doing the whole live action movie for that soon too. Um, Ghost in the Shell was wow, revolutionary. Um, first of all, I love the exactness of it, and they also used mixed media and locations. I mean, Ghost in the, I mean, if you ever been to Hong Kong, when the airport was in Hong Kong you'll understand why you see those jumbo jets flying above the the, the buildings. Um, So there are really references of time. They're recording our life. That's interesting because I've only seen Ghost in the Shell like once or twice. I mean, um, it's funny. I, I should actually know this because I actually went to school for Asian studies, but I, 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 the films I would pay attention to in my uh, geeky Japanese class were like these obscure Japanese animations like um, 
there was this film called She the Brat and uh, Aim for the Ace, which were like these um, late 70s uh, Japanese animations, which are completely unknown in the uh, Western world. Yet you can find some English uh, fan sub or, or fan subtitle or some it, on YouTube. But it, it's I know what you're saying where it's like animation could reflect the reality of the world at that time. So in Ghost of the Shell's time, or even of Akira, it does represent that kind of mid-80s or type of sci-fi thing of the digital age and how computers and robots and androids... Yeah, it's something to definitely... And surveillance. Mm-hmm. And surveillance. Yes. I mean, that's something of, um, of interest. Uh, well, for the future. So if you're in your 20s, what are you looking forward to? <laughs> huh. um, well, uh kind of want to graduate school and then um get a job and then get married have a beautiful girlfriend and then um maybe have children and but the yeah. thing is I don't, i'm not so sure if to have money for that and, or even accomplish my arts i'm not so sure if i can have that anu- avenue because of means and access so it's like even not to say life is a science fiction dystopian but it seems like as life changes it there's a lot of avenues and uh, po- po- politi- politics that are happening that's it's so radical from the past what has happened since we're on that topic what do you think about putting sort of adult themes that we're discussing uh including like just, just themes that relate to life and to children's uh cartoons well that's the uh that's my modus operandi i mean i don't even know if i'm i could I could write stories that I want to write, contemporary stories about issues of today, and find a way to conceal them in the art. I think there would be a lot of pushback, and um, and I think it's a lot. It has a lot to do with Pill Eater was saying that um, there is a softening, a a kind of again. I like this manga sweetness, this saccharine. Well, I don't know what it is. It's not really trippy, hallucinogenic. I, I call it like twee. It's very twee. Um, well, it's very twee, and it has yeah. this kind of power over uh, a being, like much like the old religions used to have over early, our ancestors. Like I'm thinking, like the cartoon shows, like Adventure Time has definitely led that twee uh, personality, or even this. Uh, I'm thinking of Bee and Puppy Cat. It's this kind of flash, you know, post flash cartooning or some digital animation. It also has yeah. to do with a lot with like the West Coast. Where I mean, I'm not in California, but it seems to me all these cartoons are being made over there, and it, it seems to me that some of that culture uh, lingers through, even though if you're not even from. Yeah, it's kind of like this uh, yuppie kind of thing. I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, it's it's definitely I would just say twee, and it's definitely that kind of art you see on Tumblr or previous gen. You know, previous it was on Deviant Art. Now it's just like tum- they call it Tumblr art, where it's just uh, it's there, and it's also like anybody can have like a digital computer and just draw their own like twee romance cartoons. I think a lot of p- uh, kids my age they listen to twee music and draw twee things, and their subjects are about. What, how great of me of being a boyfriend and girlfriend is. And uh, there's that manga thing too, because I think manga has very of the influence, especially in that uh, Western translation of it. So, Well, do you think that there is some um, uh, unseen hands at play, guiding, suggesting, provoking even uh, some of these new social media platforms, encouraging participants to upload live more within these platforms and it you know you could think about it in terms of uh whispering in somebody's ear that then passes to whisper on but it changes to more people that hear it right they add to it that old that old game we right where you tell a story and you <laughs> oh, pass yeah, it on yeah I feel all the internet memes are kind of like that. Do you follow the different internet memes? Like the big one is like Pepe the Frog. <laughs> no, I know because I refuse to. I just choose not to. Because one, I have so. I'm really. I, I don't have the time. There's so and also, much of it. I mean, there's, there's so, so much of it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's so much of it. But then I'm not seeking anything. I'm certainly not seeking 
Peppy the Frog. Like, like the you know, it's so amazing where it's like I would think these internet memes are basically public domain cartoons where you can just upload it on 4chan and then if somebody likes it like some geeky cartoon you can get into even ms paint i don't know if that's a but you know some program and just upload it and it's like this own artist revolution that's happening but it's really humorous or even really dark and well you got to be careful because read the fine print on all of these platforms (laughs) they're public domain or right you got to read the fine print you have to be careful what you post if you're really if it's precious to you. Oh yeah, it's like if you were to there make, could be claims on it. You, you know, it's like uh, if you it's were to not make, free. The world is not yes, free, yes. even if it's packaged as imagine, free. Imagine if courage was some internet meme and you just drew it out and then it became this public <laughs> domain thing and people. Yeah, it's like um, I, don't know well, I don't know what you're saying. Is that like the whole? As long as Cartoon Network or Warner Brothers feel like they're not losing a single penny in revenue, they'll permit it. It's good marketing, good advertising. It's like who made up that whole uh, where the sunglasses fall on the character and says deal with it. It seems like now corporations or companies can just say deal with it, trademark, as it belongs to everyone. But it seems to me one guy in his basement probably made that up one day. And I don't know. It seems like if there was some trademark on it, he would have got all the – or even – I guess I don't know. I'm skeptical about the whole thing because who is the kid in the basement working for? No, no one, and that's the you don't oh, know that. That's don't know. my point. <laughs> the leader. That's my point. It could be a conspiracy. Yeah, it's not a comp- well. I don't know what that is. I mean, are you saying conspiracy in terms of let's say uh, a, a government of a state recognizes <laughs> RICO uh-huh. or the fact that in fact conspiracies do exist? I don't know. How do you mean by that? When I, I, I think know. that's a very hot word and it's been made to provoke feelings instead of intelligence. Mm-hmm. So I'd rather not use that. But all I'm saying is that it's a it's a very it's a very tricky world that's being developed and luring in. And mm-hmm. I think that for me it's more important to to keep an open mind about what it is that we're doing and for what purpose. To go where? Mm-hmm. Do you know of uh, the whole creepy pasta thing? That's a very popular internet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've heard about it. It's basically somebody goes online and they make a horror story, but pretend it's real. But then everyone believes it's real, but it's not real. And then people spread it. It's kind of like internet fads, but it's horror story. And I always think sure, to myself, sure. this reminding back back to your art, it seems like Courage the Cowardly Dog has definitely scarred uh, a younger millennial generation. And so I think they'll make creepy pastas based upon courage, especially yeah, uh, I hope so. like, uh, you know, there's Slender Man, the rake, rushing, sleeping experiment. But I'm thinking of like, you know, you did recently did commentary on, you know, King Ramsey, the King Ramsey cursed, where he's like return the sloth character. And that that scared me when I was young in elementary or even... You know what's often cited on the countdowns of scary things? Uh, your, 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 uh, I think it's your worthless, that, that blue thing in the perfect episode of uh, Courage. Sure. That was my brother's design. <laughs> he designed that before he passed on. Uh, and um, I brought it to a really, wow, what a master at this technology converted it into this, this CGI. And using very subtle moves made that thing kind of float. You said also that um, King Ramsey, uh, the, when you were doing the CGI for that, you said that you like Parappa the Rapper. The oh man, I was I was knocked out by that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you, I mean, it is what it is, right? I mean, it's not a deconstruction. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's no. a reveal and the celebration of normalcy in its unfamiliar form. I mean, my mom is a huge fan of uh, Rodney Greenblatt. Um, his art is just... Oh, it's really? really? It's really, really wonderful. Yeah, my mom has actually... We, we actually the met him in person. Cruel mom. I know. Cruel we mom. met him in person, and he's a very nice guy. Um, but, yeah, we yeah. should have him on the show sometime. He's a... He's a you know, wow. He's a, wow. He's a, he's he a would love that. Yeah, he's a practicing Buddhist, actually. It's He's very Why interesting. Not? And um, he's done... His, his Most of his art is in Japan, and uh, he's a very interesting background. I wonder if you ever met him in person. Or... All is impermanent. All is without self. Do you That's... get a lot of uh, inspiration from your work uh, from personal experiences, 
a lot of it is a very uh, dreamlike. Uh, also, have you gotten any inspiration from uh, dreams that you've had? No, no, I don't. Uh, I don't do that Dolly thing. You know, he used to uh, uh, elicit sleep awake, sit in a chair, hold a hold a, a utensil in his fingertips, and just at the moment he falls asleep, he drops the spoon. Right, and that ma- and that image he sees in his brain gets flashed like a camera. And he records it and uses the material for his canvases. At least that's the myth, right? I never met him. But I don't do that. Dreams don't talk to me that way. In fact, I was just trying to sort out what, what dreams really are. And speaking of Buddhism, I mean, what, what are dreams? So the old Greeks, they thought the dreams were, were demons. Demons not given their due not given their chance to express themselves. So they're, in, so they're repressed impulses. What does that tell you about expressing oneself? Don't hold back, because then the demons just run amok. Right? And how often do you hear that, no matter what, what age you are? It's, it's interesting. Um, that, that, that's funny. Um, I was just thinking of... Um the, 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 you know, you've recently been doing Goose in High Heels, and uh, I just wanted to oh, talk boy. about that because I've been yeah, interested in that. I, I was the, interested in the, that because it seems to me when I, I look at those animated clips, they almost tell a, a story that seems like – I don't know. It seems like it's your Magnus Optus or Opus. You know, It seems like it looks like this big <laughs> grand art that's about to happen, and it seems that's to me what you're, yeah. what you're talking about seems like – there's that philosophy and cartooning, but there's no words being incited or there's, um, uh, you know, while well, I was just looking at, there's like that, there's one clip where it's like a guy in a blanket. It looks like they're going to have sex, but then they, they go around and then, <sighs> like, I don't know. It seems, is there some message in that? Or I don't know when goose and high heels comes out, but it seems like this is traditionally done in flash and, uh, and something you're doing on your own. And, um, if there's philosophy behind that, what to expect. Well, I'm, I'm using the, the software in a very unusual way. It's not intended to be used as a traditional pen and paper, but that's what I'm doing. I'm just drawing directly into the thing. And it's my first attempt. So I'm, I'm well, I'm teaching myself, discovering things as I go along. But Goose in High Hills really tells the story of, has three stories in it. And uh, it's a it's an absolute essential piece that I feel like I'm doing. It's that's all I'm doing. I'm totally devoted into it, losing myself into it because I just feel it's so absolutely necessary. And the unpleasant part of it, it's inspired by the events that happened six years ago in Fukushima, and unfortunately, sadly, despairingly, happening again just recently. I think yesterday another monumental earthquake going off. I mean, just, we don't have a break, we don't have a chance. And here is art, here is art again, acting as a messenger. How do you get the message out? What's important to you? For me, I don't know what's more important than the continuity of a good life, of a a life that's not shortened how do we live today? Do we live at some irrational height? Because it's like, you know, Prince is 1999 or, you know, party today, tomorrow may be gone. It's totally irrational to me. I don't know who your, your idols and mentors are, but I feel deeply that our authorities have failed us. To allow this event to happen ongoing. And no. I'm an artist. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah, art does reflect on that. Pain, so, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's well, interesting to think about. Life in Transition, a film I made back in 2000, 2001, right? Mm-hmm. Not September 11. That inspired that film. I was uh, filled with all sorts of horror. Oh, yeah. That I mean, short were, film was that. Were you in New York at the time, though, and 11 happened? Of course, of course, but it's not what I want to talk about. I know, I know, but it seems that it's that powerful of emotion to write it in medium that I never would think that way about. Uh, like but we're talking about art, right? And yeah. how, does, how does this definition of art making compare to the memes, memes, Snowden, Snowden, how do you pronounce it, <laughs> of today? 
and these social media platforms, what they call social media platforms, even I'm repeating it. That's how the Pavlovian instinct is so rooted in our cultures. It's interesting you kind of contrast like those uh, memes of art. One, there's sort of like this debate of whether art should be like for the masses and everyone should be engaged in producing their own art or is it something more kind of elitist and are, are some people like maybe on a higher intellectual level? Which do you, do you sort of look at things that way? I never look at things in, el- in an elitist way. I'm not an elitist. A higher intellectual level, well, one goes, one is trained. You know, you train, you take your personal initiative and will, and you want to learn things. The worst, I feel, for a society, a civilization, is not to educate themselves. So I feel that art can provide necessary tools in learning how to express oneself and that is what I'm interested in as as you know Joseph Campbell some guy that was interested in, in, in old people old fossils and cultures brilliant man he thought you know he knew he wasn't changing the world but he was changing people and that's what I feel like we need to do if you have a message for your millenniums and whoever else wants to come along, your 20-somethings, your teens, this is what's vital. we got to wake up. You know, mm-hmm. We're in a tough, tough, tough world. I mean, it seems like we'd, the first way to wake up would to be show everyone your cartoons, your most meaningful cartoons. Well, you know? when I make Goose <laughs> in High Heels, who knows how it's going to be received? Because it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be pleasant. I already lost. I mean, networks won't. I mean, they would call my shows too weird now. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying courage may not have been, possibly not have been produced today. And that we were able to get the messages of courage, the themes, the themes that were important to me produced at that time is a miracle. That it's getting aired today continuously somewhere on this planet is a miracle because the role of art is to touch on a lot of serious issues uh, facing uh humanity and uh social commentary and the as you were saying like the media networks their goal is to, to obviously to make as much of a profit as possible so if something has any kind of a controversy it might make people uncomfortable that's going to go against their profit motive, but the, that contradicts the goal of the artist is to kind of get people out of their comfort zone and to challenge their own ways of thinking. Yeah, I, I wish that I was able to do that, but I'm not there yet. But I don't, uh, I have no idea what to expect with Goose when it gets released, whether or not it will be received, if it will. Um, actually be able to do its role that I intend but all I can do is employ all my soul into this thing and listen and observe and be pure that's why I'm totally pure a year and a half going two years 2017 we'll finish the film and I I can't be distracted by anything else but just this film but the art the way these things move not a single word of dialogue. This thing is going to run in maybe 23 minutes. And it's going to be, if, if I fail, if I fail, I go into diplomacy. I mean, really, think about it. If I can't, if I can't be an animator anymore, I'm going to try to learn to slow the machine down. Isn't that what diplomacy should be? Diplomats, diplomacy. <laughs> You're not going to stop evil. Evil is natural. Maybe you can just, you know, trip them up a bit. I don't know. I have a great admiration to political diplomats now. Maybe it's because I, I don't know what demographic I fit into. What's a 50-something? Uh, like baby, baby, baby boomers. <laughs> what? It's like what? baby boomers, Gen X, and a, then millennial. 
right? Those are like really? the three. Those are like the three main like generations. Am I a baby boomer? I'm not so sure. <laughs> I don't. I, wouldn't, I don't know, I don't what, know what I am. Okay. I, like I guess that's the like people nothing. born in the like the 50s to early 60s. No, I was born in 63. You're, so you're kind of on the border of uh, baby boomers and like uh, Generation X. I missed all the spaceships. Oh, yeah. when the UFOs came around, right? Yeah. I missed that big trip. Do you identify with an era in uh, history? So you pretty much like grew up in the 80s to in 70s? Yeah, sure. It's, I don't remember the 70s at all, but the 80s was my was my period of just you know, growing into my pants. Uh, but I don't know. I don't think that there is. I think right now, right now, babies, right now is the time. Do you, do you, I'm just interested, but do you know of the, the thief and the cobbler? That, of course. Richard yeah. Williams is yes. my, he's a, he's a, he's a mentor. I, I really, and I, when I do special programs, um, in animation, I use his very brilliant book. Yes, um, I, I have um, that book actually in my library. I had that when I was like eight, ten years old or something, and I wanted to do cartooning. And I did do flash cartooning um, and had it on Newgrounds for a bit. I mean, some of it was on YouTube, but I just did clip art. And basically, I, I didn't even know he did Thief and the Cobbler until much later, but I just took it for granted and just read the book as this is the animator survival guide. <laughs> well, he wasn't able to complete that vision of his. And there is a myth, that should be a myth about the the, the hero-like character who goes on this adventure but does not succeed, but, but produces a brilliant, unfinished thing. I, I don't, I'm not familiar of such a thing. Mm-hmm. It, I'm it, not familiar with this story. It just reminds me of like something you would do on your own path. No like way! I would finish everything. I'd finish <laughs> everything. I don't know. I don't know if there's like some cartoon I don't know about. Films gonna... like uh, this, you, uh, this applies to uh, uh, you, cartoons as well, yeah. but films are always like kind of very uh, form- uh, formulaic. So you there's like the plot, and then there's like the finale, and everything is resolved, and it doesn't reflect like uh, reality. No. Well, you know, um, <laughs> it's necessary. You, I mean, we need to be able to possess a prescient power. And that would be expecting a conclusion or an outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be disappointed. It's kind of like when you're young, like you have this uh, dream of what your life is going to be like when you grow up. But then you kind of get to a certain point in your life and you like think like, uh, this is it. Well, the thing is, is that we're constantly evolving. Think about, I know it's not possible, and why would one? Think of our entry out of the caves into the sunlight. Wow! Have you ever been to a cave where our ancestors drew on the walls like children? I've only been I to, have. I only been to the Philadelphia Art Museum and only seen those things, but that's interesting. Go. Go if you want to be part of something that's so much bigger than our, our life right now. And remind yourself of the connection. 40,000 years ago, I saw our ancestors blow circles on a wall, or I saw the wall. And I saw the circles. I wasn't there 40,000 years ago. But it changes you. You start to see how we developed. And then maybe perhaps you start asking yourself, how did we go this way and not that way? No, that's that's, that's interesting about, you know, even how the first animation, was it just like flip book or was it just like comics or, you know, it's just like, no, no, it was in a cave. It was in the caves. Look at the animals. Look at look at our Neolithic ancestors drawing multiple legs of an animal. They were running in place. Can you imagine the power of a pure mind observing nature? You in nature. You probably would 
blow out your brain from the intensity of it. I mean, um, I, I, I do like poetry on that. And sometimes the poetry – sorry, there's some poetry out there that does talk about nature or there are real actual accounts that talk about – but yeah, if you're there and experience, it's, it's something of a different um, – like I, I, I'm going off – digressing here i'm thinking of martin well, I, can, yeah, I can understand that feeling like going, going to the places like in the mountains and and places in california and the wilderness and the thing is that it's, it's something people just everyone should do because people are constantly connected like to their devices and to the internet and to the tv oh baby are you so right and yeah. if you go out right. to a place and even when people travel i mean people still bring that uh, stuff with them uh, but, but there's just something about going to a place like that in the mountains and just spending, even if it's like a couple hours on a hike, it can just uh, clear out your mind. And Yeah, we don't want to get uh, uh, too narrow. I mean, I know we're, the life is for one to live as they want, right? As long as we're not harming ourselves and others, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Think of what the cat in the hat said. Now, now, have no fear. Have no fear, said the cat. My tricks are not bad, said the cat in the hat. Now, this cat, Dr. Seuss, he was tripped out, lived in a lighthouse. What are lighthouses? Guideposts. Signaling ships way out on the horizon to safety and there is art passing through the generations with messages that still matter to some will our memes, memes, whatever they call these things on our current platforms, will they will these art will these arts that we're making today Will they exceed a hundred years in time? I think uh, James Joyce wrote in a lighthouse. I don't know. This is just a whole thinking about that. Um, Well, this kid, this cat is amazing. Think of the artist as a young man. mm -hmm. Think of, read read that book, huh? I think, yeah, I do remember it, yeah. A portrait of an artist as a young man. What I find with my uh, work, I mean, I'm a painter, is... Oh, bravo, bravo. I get started on something, and I don't necessarily, like, think I have this specific, like, uh, point I'm going to get across to people, but I, I just, I see an image, and then I, then eventually it, it comes out kind of, a, it comes out subconsciously, and yeah. you feel something if you look, you look at a painting, sure. but it's not always expressed in words. Of course, of course. Well, that's the dynamic of the aesthetic arrest. Right? It's not a thing you can describe. You feel it. I was just uh, talking about the subject of does art possess soul? And how does one define the soul of the thing? And I believe that one can identify this thing that we call a soul. You hear it in music. Right? Mm-hmm. You see it in interactions between a human and an animal. And people perceive uh, art differently. Like with your work, do you want people to have their own personal experience or do you have your kind of uh, vision that you want people to get from that? Or can people have their own experience from, uh, from work in general and from your work specifically? Of course, of course. There's no point in in pulling the curtain over and showing everything. Like, I'm thinking of, you, you know, relation to your art. I mean, um, this might sound a little silly, but I know, you know, Return of Sergeant Pecker, it's often say that as like an X-rated or even pornographic animation, but in a way... But it isn't pornographic. Pornographic, isn't, yeah. pornographic is, if you're a skier and you hang mountains of, covered with snow, in your home, you could call that art pornographic mm-hmm. because there's no mystery, right? Mm-hmm. Erotic art employs the mystery. 
Yeah, and it's definitely like the film has a lot to do war with the soul, where it's like, uh, you know, Sergeant Pecker is going to go in this girl, but he doesn't doesn't really happen. He gets all excited for it, and it's kind of this weird anticlimactic ending, but it's definitely soulful and meaningful. If it wasn't, you know, if you're a prude, you're probably going to look at it as some, like you said, that you'll misinterpret as porn, but in a way, it does have soul in that, even avoid it all humor. And that's kind of a, a debate about, like, uh, violence and sex in film, I mean, there's some people who don't want to see any sex or violence at all. And then there's a lot of films that people who just put in a sex and violence just to, like, sell, to make a profit, or for kind of the, kind of the shock value. Uh, do you think, like, uh, erotica and violence in uh, art and film uh, serves a purpose? Well, I can't answer uh, uh, in an intelligent way because I, I'm not interested in, in those topics. That's, that's no, that's interesting. I mean, um, speaking about you know soul in cartoons, I mean, um, it, it's funny. One of my uh, favorite ones that really where I got into you was uh, this old MTV cartoon, Angry uh, Cabaret, and that was like a short that was like kind of yeah. it was only like yeah. eight minutes long, but it was like it yeah. seemed like it was almost like the courage I've always wanted to see, and it was like you know two, yeah. punk, two yeah. punk characters where they listen to like cool 90s you know reference to industrial music like kmfdm and just like in this dance club and nightclub or something it seems like that but it was that, underground yes an yes underground club and this like hr gigger-esque kind of surreal yeah. and it's just yeah. like that's so cool i just wish it was a cartoon and yeah. i feel like the soul in that was like more on the tones of a punk style and i've always got that thing where it's like at that time when i was liking you i like stuff like by joan and vasquez like invader zim and giant the homo salamaniac and uh yeah i liked invader um invader zim was cut short yeah yeah and it's just that it goes along with that the i call it the grimdark aesthetic where um i also was into i guess like alex party i mean in juxtapose or mid juxtapose magazines would often you know cite these artist as kind of you know up and coming but also like i said today it's it's twee now it's not grim dark grim dark is kind of it's too much now but i was a part of that grim dark and i still like that grim dark uh, aesthetic to it and i think the soul of that it really represents a target audience that once once was and uh it's interesting what i like about the grim and dark the grim dark element is that you could add stuff to it i added of course surreal comedy and a bit of Dadaism in narrative continuity. Um, and this is what really excites me, uh, is the ability to mash it up. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, it's, that's, I think, that's interesting. I think when people sort of hear things like Grim and Dark, they automatically have this uh, assumption that things like uh, dark topics, like, say, violence, but I see a lot of it is just creating this sort of uh, otherworldly uh, atmosphere transforming you like in a sense you almost feel like you're transported to another uh, dimension the f themes of surrealism I don't do any violence I don't it just doesn't do anything for me it's not intelligent enough it's not intelligent for me I mean, but I like when I mean dark I'm talking about spiders crawling you know, under the covers while you're with your your lover. You know, this kind of what's going on here. I, I don't know. I want to... I feel bad. I want you to have a smile when you're passing through the dark. I want you to be turned on. Yeah. I, I feel bad when uh, Courage, when, like, he yeah. ever screams, he, like, you know, his teeth explode or he loses his eyes. And it's always goofy when Courage is oh, screaming. Oh, man, feels that's like he's in pain. Yeah. He's like, he's in pain. I don't know. He loves it. I think okay. he's a. I think he's a masochist. <laughs> There's a bit of masochism in in our lives. I agree with it. Why do people do things that are so inimical to their progress? Why do they harm themselves by making stupid decisions? For instance, I wouldn't. I think myself. a lot of people are just. They do harmful things just to fit in because it's a conformist thing to do. Well, to themselves, I'm talking about that. Let's uh, let's just keep it to the idea that. No, no, I'm talking about other people. 
people do things that harm themselves to fit into with other people or society. Perhaps, perhaps, but then you're revealing an illness in the society. That's uh, that's interesting. I mean, um, no, that, no, no, that's that's. Uh, I was th- I was thinking of uh, more on the lines. This might be a little off topic, but um, going. What has the... been on topic here? I know, no. <laughs> I'm just I'm just thinking of going back to loops and making uh, because to the opposite effect, um, I'm thinking of a very older cartoon uh, when Lily Lily Laneley moved in. That was um, oh yeah, sure. that was like your second one, and uh, I always thought that was a very sentimental or kind of in opposite to uh, Angry C- uh, Cabaret. It's kind of like. Um, like, like, you, like, I think it's like more of the Woody Allen type drama, and more of a, uh, and I, it, yeah. it's it's interesting because it's, that's like if I was to pick up cartooning or even do art, I think that's something I would do personally by uh, emotionally or something. It seems to me that that uh, that that lifestyle is something that could be aesthetically uh, put it into cartooning, in such uh, respect. I mean, it's interesting. Well, though. pill eater, pill eater. Let's say you're learning animation now. What's more important, the way your object feels or the way your object moves? Well, it's like more like technical and aesthetic-wise and depending how you put that in uh, discipline. I mean, no, I no, just... Feelings. feelings. You know, I like to... I still... Well, this might sound a little strange. I, I, I sometimes will draw in my uh, book and I used to do... Um, when I stopped doing cartooning is when I started doing porn... <laughs> porn and then um i I only draw now just in like my school notes and um you know i Uh, did you get into the manga porn (laughs) yes yes um i actually yeah that's very very intense stuff not not that i like the aesthetic thing i don't like the whole violent like you were just saying i don't like violent stuff i just very violent since you're kind of on that topic of violence there's this uh series on adult swim it's like a super jail and it's extremely uh violent but it is, has a very fascinating aesthetic because it is like a very psychedelic, a very uh, surreal. You yeah. familiar with that show? I know it. Of course, it's done here in Brooklyn, or it was. I don't know if they're still doing it. It's um, speaking of a uh, hang tie, real quick. Um, and Lily Laneley moved in. Um, this this might sound a little cute, kind of. Um, <laughs> I always thought Lily was uh, Asian, but she doesn't look Asian. But I always thought she was, and it kind of reminds Baby, me. Baby, it comes through. It That's reminds me of my own life. About. I'm just saying the mashup. We're talking about the very same thing. You know how the manga influences is taking Western elements and mashing it up into their culture, right, to produce their characters. I was doing the same. Because mm-hmm. I usually talk. A lot, but in um, reverse, because mm-hmm, I, I usually like to talk in Asian studies about this might sound cute white male Asian female relationships, and uh, even though as much as I would like to think that, but instead it seems to be more of the Woody Allen to, uh, Jewish type. I don't know if that's the correct definition, but I want to believe it's rather Asian. But yeah, it is. I'm trying. I'm telling <laughs> you, those were the influences. Yes. Okay, that's cool. Of course, we're talking about that very same thing. We're mashing it up. Nothing lives on its own. Mm. Listen, our come on, our ancestors, they had they had sailed around the world. This is 10,000, 10 to 7,000 years ago. This Columbus thing is for the birds. Mm. That's, yeah, there's a lot That's to why we history is so important just to get a sense of perspective. And not only that, it is empowering. You don't live in a vacuum. Where did we come from? Where are we going? What's your intention? Yes. What do you want out of all this mess? I notice uh, with the with history and uh, I mean, we're just if you think about history going back millions of years, we're just this tiny little uh, blip in a sense. But I know in the past people were more thinking like, what is the future going to be like? And I know people just got – I feel a lot of people feel like, oh, this is the present and we're kind of like uh, plateauing. I don't know, baby. I don't know because I don't have a – I'm very, very, very down right now on this whole thing. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Unless there's a way to take unstable atoms and make them stable again. I don't know how how this I don't know how this adventure ends. I mean, you could be a uh, Buddhist, but 
<laughs> yeah, all the great Buddhists, they're not on the planet anymore. They all left. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, yeah, I know. That's, that's interesting. Also, we don't want to withdraw from life. Buddhism is a kind of withdrawal. We want to be engaged. We want to evoke change for the better, for the good of all, including nature. Anyway, that's the message between Dilly and his art. And I'm only beginning at this game, and I just, I'm really just only beginning. I don't know if I'm going to get funding to make more series or where, where, where I'm going to go. But right now, Goose and High Heels, I'll finish that up in 2017, and I'll see what, how the universe responds. The universe. <laughs> is that for a, a Cartoon Network, or that's going to be done independently? No, this is an entirely independent project out of my studio, Stretch Films. I wish it was on the, the networks, but... Yep. No, it's not for the networks. I know. I wish it's it for, was. It's really for. It's for the. It's for us all. I hope so. I hope it does. I hope it rings true. And I have to tell you, boys, I've never had a better conversation at this hour. And I want to thank you both so very, very much for having me on the show. It's just been fantastic. Pill eater, what a joy! Thank you for all your your your, your bravery. Wish you lots of success, boys. Robert, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. Good night. Good night. Good night.